Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for Renaissance Periodization, video number three in beginner training for hypertrophy series, choosing exercises. So we have six rules slash procedures for choosing exercises for your beginner clients. First, obviously, choose exercises that target each muscle. Don't forget anything. Each muscle, like a lot of people don't want to train calves and just from training legs, they get great calf growth. You don't have to do calves. You don't have to do forearms by themselves. You sure shit don't have to do traps. Everything else in there. Are, and if you ask about tibialis anterior, just, just go away. For the love of God, nobody cares. Abs, you can train. But remember that all of the compound heavy basics your client is going to do is going to actually hypertrophy the, their abs considerably. In addition to that, most people don't actually want abdominal hypertrophy. They want to have a slim waistline with a six pack. That's almost always just losing body fat, mostly in how you deal with the kitchen and cardio and physical activity and not a lot with lifting weights. But almost all the other muscles, the glutes, the hamstrings, the quads, the adductors, the shoulders, the back, the chest, blah, 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 the arms, that's going to be muscles that you have to check the boxes on. How do you train them? For beginners, compound movements are preferred. Why? because beginners have very low minimum effective volumes. They just don't need a lot of stimulus to grow. And compounds allow you to hit multiple muscles at the same time, which means that with minimal technique learning, not having to learn how to do seven or eight different exercises in a session, but more like four or five, they can get amazing results. It saves them time. It saves you time. It saves them neural learning and the ability to be like, oh man, like I had to keep track of how many different exercises, it simplifies everything. If we look at compounds, there are kind of two different ends of a spectrum for compounds, distributed compounds and focused compounds. Focused compounds are technically compound lifts. They involve more than one joint, but they really focus most of their effort and stimulus on a one single target muscle. Great example of this is a wide grip bench. The wide grip bench technically trains your triceps, but very little. It technically trains your chest a lot. And as a matter of fact, on raw stimulus magnitude, a wide grip bench can train your chest more, better than even a dumbbell fly, which is an isolation move for your chest. However, a distributed compound, that's a focused compound, a compound focused on a specific single target muscle. A distributed compound is a compound lift that is done in such a way that it distributes the load and the stimulus to multiple muscles. Great example here is a close grip bench. Is a close grip bench for chest? Yes. Is it for triceps? Yes, also. And also front delts. That's three muscles you're getting with one movement. Typically, in an advanced or intermediate individual, I mean, look, like you do four sets of close grip bench, yeah, you're going to grow some chest and triceps, but you got to do some extensions, you got to do some flies, you got to do more volume to fill in the blanks. For a beginner, I mean, really, three or four sets of close grip bench is all of the stimulus that their triceps, chest, and front delts can handle and need for optimum, maximum growth. So if you just include one close grip benching exercise, one close grip underhand rowing exercise, and one upright row type of exercise, they have just trained their forearms, their biceps, their triceps, their chest, and their whole fucking back in three exercises. And really, the shoulder training, you could have just done one set of lateral raises and left, and that would have been totally good enough even for shoulders. So distributed compounds are amazing. And look, the lateral raises would have been cool, but if you do some kind of upright rowing or some kind of face pulling, not only does it hit the side delts, but it even hits the biceps and forearms a little bit more, giving them that extra volume that they might not have gotten quite from doing the back stuff. Distributed compounds, compounds typically with a closer grip, with a closer stance if it's your feet, that hit multiple things at the same time, they're really, really, really good use of your time with clients. Real good stuff to include them. Next, if they have a real big priority to train one muscle versus another, you can do more than one exercise for that muscle. Of course, be mindful of how much time you're spending. Make sure you can put in all the other exercises to hit all the other muscles. For example, let's say, look, I want everything to grow, but my chest especially, that means you can do Close grip benches is the first exercise, take care of some of chest, all of triceps that they want, all the frontals that they want, and then follow up with some dumbbell pressing with a slightly wide grip, wide position at the bottom, and then boom, you've got two exercises for chest, more than enough for triceps and front delts, and you're good to go. So sometimes exercises, you'll lose, you'll use two exercises uh, so that you can really focus on a target muscle that they want. It's not always the case because sometimes, look, you do four sets of squats, even if they really want to grow their quads, that's all you need. Sometimes you can add some leg presses and that tends to work really well. Next, number four, 
If you have muscles in beginners, especially that are deprioritized, for example, they don't want to train their upper body at all. They said, and you convince them, look, some training is just for your, for good health and for good, uh, uh, look. So once you get lean, you look like you're an adult human with muscles instead of like some kind of like emaciated child. It's okay. Fine, fine, fine. Deprioritize muscles. Let's say they're back and chest. They really don't care about. They can get half a compound each, which means like in the earlier analogy, if you have, you know, chest is on the back burner and so are triceps, uh, a close grip bench doesn't count as just like you need to do that for chest and then something else for triceps like pushdowns. No, no, no. Chest and triceps both got hit with one compound. So it's half a compound each for them means you did it. So if someone needs a competent upper body, you can literally do two or three exercises, some kind of row, some kind of pushing movement, and maybe some kind of pulling movement for the shoulders. And then that's it. You got the whole upper body, which is like technically like eight muscles or something like that. And in just three exercises, and maybe sometimes two, if you uh, pick some of your movements really well, uh, you can have a compound that trains two, two muscles really well. And there's many different examples of that, of course, the ones I, I just gave. And also, for example, like a stiff-legged deadlift. Does it train the hamstrings? Yes. Does it train the glutes? Oh, yeah. Now, if you're really focusing on your glutes, stiff-legged deadlifts are great for the glutes, but then you might also want to do a lunge or something, two exercises, or do a glute-specific exercise, like some kind of hip thrust, as that's your core movement. Because stiff-legged deadlifts train your glutes really well, but they're limited by your hamstring, so it's not ideal. But if you have legs on the back burner, you do stiff-legged deadlifts, and then you do some squats or some leg presses, that's your whole leg taken care of right there. Next, point number five, for beginners, we prefer to use barbells, dumbbells, and bodyweight exercises like push-ups and things like that. Why? Beginners have a goal to get more muscle and drop body fat. So these exercises are definitely good for that. But you're also trying to avoid machine exercises and cable exercises for the most part. Because if you can teach people to operate their own bodies in three-dimensional space, resisting gravity, resisting various swaying forces, having to guide barbells, dumbbells, and their own body weight in space, it builds core movement competency. What do I mean by that? If I have a client learn how to barbell squat, after a few months, teaching them to hack squat or leg press or Smith machine squat or a lunge is nominally easy. Within two or three reps, they know exactly what to do because all the core positions are the same. They know knee tracking, they know foot placement, they know heel forces, they know upper body position, they know how to breathe, they know it all. It's an easy transfer because squats are more complex, they're more difficult. And if you learn how to do a squat with a barbell, you already are overqualified to learn everything else. That's the easiest thing in the world. You take a race car driver that has driven F1 cars for 10 years and you throw him in some kind of electric go-kart, he's going to know how to drive the thing, right? What about the opposite? If you teach clients early on to rely on the stability and the movement tracks of machines, they're not going to develop that core competency. If I learn in a bench press machine how to do pushing movements, then later you have me do some push-ups or some barbell or dumbbell work, I'm going to be all over the place because I'm not used to stabilizing. I'm not the person doing the track the track is the thing. The machine is the thing doing the track. So if I learn how to how to do technical racing on little electric go-karts, you put me in a formula car, I'm going to be like, how fast is this thing going? Like, ah, 250 miles an hour. No, just hit the gas. You're good. I'm like, holy shit, I'm going to die out here, which is probably realistic. So there is a situation where we hugely benefit from free weight movements, barbells, dumbbells, and machines. Sorry, machines. What the hell was I saying? Uh, barbells, dumbbells, and body weight movements like dips and push ups or whatever they can do with their own body weight lunges. Once they develop the core competency there, they can expand to a huge repertoire later in their beginner days, uh, later in their for sure, their intermediate days as a trainer, and just have a huge leg up. And small bonus, you know, when someone starts to lift with you and train with you, as they get bigger and stronger, they feel themselves more likely to be like, okay, I'm like more athletic now. I can hike better. I can do, you know, bicycle better with my family. I can row a boat. I can tug at the dog if he's pulling too hard. I can push a lawnmower. If you train people on 
free weight basics and using their own body weight, their core movement competency spreads to everything they ever do. You're, you're taking tennis lessons now or horse riding lessons like rich people do or golf or whatever. If you know how to move your body in 3D space, under load and stabilize yourself with barbells, with dumbbells, with your body weight, you're a step ahead of the competition. If you've only ever learned to lift on machines, Gee whiz, you know, you're going to have bigger muscles, like uh, obviously resistance is resistance, but it's going to have this missing piece effect where it's going to make all training later needlessly more difficult, and you're going to suck at regular life things more. And also, these barbells, dumbbells, machines, especially when done as compounds, especially with some body weight moves thrown in, they're just, they're high, their raw stimulus magnitude is so unbelievably effective. They're just really, really good. Lastly, Generally, you want to choose different exercises for each session. That's not always the case. You can definitely repeat exercises. You can do squats Monday, squats Tuesday, squats Wednesday. You probably want to shift the order where it's not squats first all the time. You can, for beginners, very new beginners, first six months, do basically the same stuff all the time. You can bore them to tears. So what you probably want to do is have them do different exercises every time. So if they see you three times a week, you know, on, on one day for legs, they do squats. On another day, they do lunges, and uh, on another day, they do step-ups with like they hold a dumbbell and they step up and they step back down to a high box. Next week, they do a little bit more load on all of them, and then boom, 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 boom. You also want these exercises to be a little bit different from one another. Here's another example. Barbell bent rows on one day, assisted pull-ups on another day, and maybe some, some lat prayers or something uh, with a, a dumbbell pullover on the third day. These exercises look very different from one another. What you don't want to do ideally, and this is not a big deal, it's a small deal worth mentioning. If you have exercises that are very, very similar, the client will have trouble learning them because they're so similar, they cross-contaminate and you, they think they're doing one, but they're really doing the other. An example for this would be like doing a rack, like a partial deadlift on one day and then a deficit deadlift on the other. It's so similar. They start hitting the positions, they mess it up and all, all sorts of things go down the drain. Another one is like a medium grip press on one day and a slightly wide grip press on another. It's like, geez, it's not really the same exercise and they're going to fuck it up and they're not going to get the right groove. So what you want to do is use some different exercises and make sure they're pretty different. It gives them a really great, well-rounded approach to training. It exposes them to a lot of different stuff. But because you're doing uh, more distributed compounds and you're really focusing on stuff, there's just maybe like a total of 10 or 15 exercises that they ever have to do per week. And it's the same 10 or 15 every single week for four to eight to 12 weeks straight. They're going to get really good at those exercises. You're going to be able to cue them in, teach them a ton. They're going to be insanely competent at it. And then they'll do really well and eventually introduce more variation, which we'll talk about in future lectures. All right, that's it. See you next time.